Hello Neighbor 2 is a sequel to Hello Neighbor. A game that will bat in its own right is something that I still have a little respect for, it's just a game that got lost in the sauce with way too many bad development decisions. The franchise itself, despite the foundation being shaky at best, was still pushing forward at Dynamic Pixels, releasing new games like the prequel Hello Neighbor Hide and Seek, and even produced a whole episode of a TV show that they and publisher Tiny Build really wanted people to review very, very extremely badly. Of course, the full-blown sequel would release on December 6, 2022, but the development of the game is just as, if not more interesting than the main title itself. Shout out to the Patreon members for helping the channel, and if you'd like to support yourself, you can check out the link below or in the corner. Now, before we get into Hello Neighbor 2, we must first check out their most famous spin-off title, Secret Neighbor, because that game had its own stuff going on that people needed to discover first. Secret Neighbor is basically Among Us but in the Hello Neighbor universe, with six kids trying to break into Mr. Peterson's basement, unbeknownst to them that one of the kids is Mr. Peterson himself trying to stop him. It's a simple little game, but where things get interesting is that in an update on December 20th, 2019, pictures are added to a random board on the wall, and in the pictures you can faintly make out the phrase slash HGP if you look close enough. For a while, people had no idea what this phrase meant, so they would try to figure out what exactly it was for, and then someone found out it was part of a URL, as typing it to the end of the Secret Neighbor website would reveal a button saying not to press it. After pressing the button, of course, a file would download called hgp.7z, but when you tried to open the file, you'd get hit with the password screen, effectively stopping your progress altogether. Once it became obvious there was more to this puzzle, people started to comb Secret Neighbor for more, well, secrets to help find the password to this mysterious file and see what was in it. This would take place over the course of a couple updates, first adding a door with the mysterious keycard that nobody knew where to find. However, some sadistic person would shoot a crow out of the sky one day, and when going to the corpse you can see it had the exact keycard needed to open the door. Once opening the door, the room wasn't exactly interesting save for the bathtub contraption in the middle. Nobody knew what to do with this at the time, but through more updates the bathtub would start to get built up more and more as time progressed, and eventually it was fully finished and ready to be used in the game. There was one issue though, there was no power to turn the contraption on, but people figured that a broken windmill located on the map could help out with that. After people did some literal digging around, they would find the pieces to the windmill to fix it up, and after pulling off an easter egg that brings in a storm to the game, the bathtub would then teleport players to a secret room never seen before. At first it seemed like a dead end once more, but people noticed that there was a color code that would appear on the button console as you teleported in, and people soon found a printer like device that looked very similar to said color console itself. After putting in the color code, players would be given a 4 digit code, and quickly putting 2 and 2 together, people figured out this was the code to open the file. However, it turned out that it wasn't the full code, and so people do the easter egg over and over again until they got the full password, an 80 digit one at that, meaning it took 20 total runs until the secret was finally cracked, giving you this massive password to put into the file. After successfully opening the file, a new launcher starts to loading, and when clicking on play you're introduced to a secret video game known as Hello Guest, better known as the Hello Guest prototype, with the start icon showing off the new crow looking character called the Guest. You start the game as a security guard in an abandoned theme park of sorts, exploring a place in the middle of the night. The atmosphere is actually pretty well done, with it being eerie, dark, and even slightly foreboding as you walk around looking at all the abandoned game posts and broken down rides. I like this a lot because it didn't feel cheap or weak, and I found it a decent middle ground for a mascot horror title. Not delving too far into the scares where young people won't like it, but also not straying too far away where it's not even scary to play. The broken down rides and stalls set up an interesting premise too, like why is the security guard even guarding the place to begin with? It's clear that it was abandoned long ago and there's no fun to be had there even during the daytime, and little unanswered questions like this always interest me because it gets you thinking, and in turn gets you more invested in the game itself. As you explore the park, you find people destroying some of the stalls, so you scare them off with your flashlight and watch them run away from you. However, this entire time while you're exploring and protecting the theme park from the vandals, the guest on the game's launch icon is stalking you from behind, and whenever you look at them they run right away. This weeping angel mechanic approach to the gameplay is fun, because it always makes you feel like you're being watched and hunted, and you gotta constantly check behind your back before the guest jump scares you, which adds more intensity to an already eerie environment. You have no idea who this even is or where they came from too, you just know not to let them get too close to you or you're in for a bad time. 
After getting jump scared a few times by the guest, you wake up in the morning and enter a store with the ability to buy certain items, with the most important things being gas cans and fuses. You buy a couple gas cans and sneak your way into the maintenance building to refill and activate the theme park's generators, tightening the valves on the machine as a guest stalks and tries to stop you in the cramped up room. Once you're finally done filling up the machine, you then head into a nearby roller coaster and take a ride on it past some animatronics as you soup and swerve your way through the park, all while the guest watches you closely. At the end of the ride, you get off and make your way to another one, and if you remember to buy a fuse you can place it in and activate the ride, watching it crash down a nearby wall and reveal the Mayak building, a building pretty relevant to Hello Neighbor's overall lore. This super early look at Hello Guest was actually not that bad in my opinion. Exploring an abandoned theme park or being chased and stalked makes for a tense gameplay loop and one that always has you literally looking behind your back. The dreary and foreboding atmosphere the park gives off adds to that too, and when combined together makes for a fun if not overly tense experience. However, this game had nothing leading you in the direction of what you actually need to do, and it's very easy to have no idea what's going on and resorting to YouTube to help figure things out. I had to do exactly that because as much as I tried to do it on my own, running around aimlessly for a good 20 or so minutes ain't exactly the most fun gameplay experience if you ask me. After playing through it all, while it's rather short once you know what you're doing, this was a great introduction for people to see what dynamic pixels have been up to when crafting the next title in the Hello Neighbor franchise. I can see why people were excited for the future, because this game was looking to take pieces of what made the original good and refine them to make a gameplay experience that was actually scary to play, and not full of a bunch of useless and confusing content that completely ruined the first game. On June 13th, 2020, Tiny Build would release the newest version of Hello Guest that Dynamic Pixels had been working on, aptly named Hello Guest Alpha 1. The game starts off with letting you choose your character in the playthrough, and I chose Quentin in mine. It's basically the same as the prototype with you hired to protect the park from vandals as you avoid the guests from the shadows beyond. However, the theme park itself seems to have been scaled down quite a bit, though there's a lot more attention to detail now, like with updated textures on pretty much everything, new plums of grass throughout, better lighting, and overall just more refined graphically. With that being said, I personally feel like it loses a bit of that tense vibe the prototype had, because that one felt a lot more scary to explore given its darker and bigger area, whereas this ironically enough despite the better lighting and graphics, feels less scary to play to me. The reason so is because the world itself looks more colorful overall, and while it makes sense from a production perspective given the setting, to me seeing all the colors versus seeing the dark tint of blues and grays in a prototype takes me out of the horror mood in the process. The Alpha even has a couple cutscenes too, like when you first start the game you're riding on a bicycle on your way to the park, or an unfinished one where if you take too much fall damage you lay in the bed with the cast on until the next day starts. There's even one introducing the guests doing some weird stuff at the top of the theme park, which given what little we know about them only makes us more interested in what exactly is going on and just who exactly this person is. I like the mysteriousness going on here, as it's not ham-fisted or boring, but actually interesting, which helps lead you more into the game and wanting to figure out the secrets of the theme park. As you explore the park, you find a building locked behind a gate that needs a key to open it, and after exploring some more you do eventually find a key in a secret room above the main shed, finally being able to open the door and see what's inside. It's just a small little room with another door that won't open, but if you venture to the outskirts of the level, you can jump on top of a platform and make your way to the room of a building, hopping in from a hole in the ceiling and collecting a generator. After buying the parts you need from the store, you head back to the roof of the building, find a strange machine, and after connecting the generator to it, you find out it lets you combine items to make things, in which I made bouncy shoes. Back at the building, you connect some generators to some switches outside, and in doing so you have a light puzzle that you solve in order to open the door to the elevator. As you travel up the elevator shaft with the help of the bouncy shoes, you place a camera at the top and head back down to the generator, using the camera to look at the lights in the shaft and again complete the puzzle. You head up the elevator shaft and out the exit, and eventually find yourself outside the park before a cutscene plays showing off a mysterious man kidnapping Quentin. <laughs> Now Hello Guest Alpha 1, while overall more refined and better looking, feels like a step backwards ironically enough. The main issue I found is that despite the setup being to figure out what the guest is up to, some random new character comes in and interrupts your progress as the game ends. It's annoying to set up another plot within an already pretty vague one that you're currently on, and feels like the developers had too many cooks in the kitchen so to speak. 
I understand the point of these games is to let people explore and figure things out, but when there's so much unexplained stuff going on that never gets resolved, or even a hint that you're making progress to resolving the issue, it makes the game feel rushed, unfinished, and worst of all, like it's wasting your time. It was also very short as well, and not in a good way, but more like a way where they rushed out the final product because they had a deadline to meet and didn't want to get into hot water with the publisher. I wish they spent more time on the story with the guest itself rather than introduce a new character and plot point as the game ends, because having two things that don't seem related to each other at all just makes for a cliffhanger clearly meant to keep people interested, when all it does is confuse people even more. However, this was just the alpha and not the full game, so while annoying to deal with, it's not a game breaker or anything like that. In fact, Hello Guest Alpha 2 is already being teased, showing off a brand new location called the Mill for players to explore. The location looked mysterious and it was clear that things were starting to head in a familiar direction like the original title based on the screenshots that came out. Overall, things are still looking good for the game, as all those other issues can be easily figured out and approved upon as the development progresses, and the mistakes made in the first title didn't seem to be coming to fruition so far, which was a great thing to see. Things would change however, as in July 2020, game publisher Tiny Build will buy out Dynamic Pixels and form Eerie Guest Studios, effectively shutting down Dynamic Pixels for good. While a lot of employees moved right to Eerie Guest, this meant that Tiny Build now had full control of the studio's development projects, but they still had one more trick up their sleeve. On July 23rd, Tiny Build will show off more of Hello Guest during the Xbox Games Conference, showing off the stylish new graphics and the player entering the guest house looking for the neighbor himself, Mr. Peterson. As the player sneaks around the house, the guest notices he's there and starts to look around for them, almost capturing them before the player locks him out just in time. As they escape from a window, the guest does capture him and drags him into the house, name dropping the game as Hello Neighbor 2, showing that Mr. Peterson was a guest the entire time as he burns the costume. This meant that Hello Guest was never a real game in development, it was just a ploy to keep people busy while they developed the sequel in secret behind the scenes. This was a pretty nice fake out that Tiny Build pulled off, and the fact they managed to keep the real game a secret the whole time was impressive. While it seems that Hello Guest was never a real game and will never be a real game, its existence is something that is interesting to look back upon. Hello Neighbor 2 being revealed makes so much sense now, like why Hello Guest felt so aimless, they probably didn't want to put too much effort into a game that will never be completed, and so just hastily put things together in order to give people something to play in the meantime. While the game itself is still not fun given said aimlessness, I can forgive it as its entire existence was to fake us out, in which they did exactly that. There are so many things that can be said about Hello Guest and how things could have gone in one direction or another, but that's all a bunch of what ifs and what could have been so I ain't gonna sweat over it too much. Along with the Hello Neighbor 2 reveal trailer would be the alpha dropping as well, giving players a first look at the real game that was in development. The alpha starts off with a cutscene of Quentin, who is now a private journalist of sorts, watching a neighbor lock down the door for some reason, and putting the key to said lock in a furnace, giving the player an idea of what to do, get the key in a furnace, and open up the locked door. Having an actual objective told to you this time is good, because instead of aimlessly trying to figure out what to do, you now know exactly what to do, you just need to figure out what tools and such to use in order to progress. The graphics are of course not as good as the trailer, but that's to be expected. It still looked fine though, nothing weird or out of the ordinary going on, basically just the first game with better lighting in my opinion. The game has a lot of trial and error going on, and I went in blind to figure things out on my own without any help. I figured I would use the camera for the door with the code on it, but getting the neighbor there was honestly just a luck based thing for me, I just waited until he decided to open the door and took a mental note of the code. I snuck in, looked around and found a crowbar which I obviously needed to use in order to get the wooden planks off the door. As far as the furnace went, I won't lie, I had no idea what I was doing, I just noticed that when I was in the room at one point the little needle was lower so I figured I'd just wait until it ran out. When I mean wait, I literally just waited, I don't know if that was even the correct way to do it, but I still got the key so good on that. It was at this point where I had no idea what to do, because I kept trying to get the wooden planks off but the game never let me, it would play the animation but nothing would happen. Mr. Peterson would also out of nowhere go full aggro on me and never stop chasing no matter where I was, and that ruined the entire experience because I couldn't get anything done. I restarted the level and ran through everything again but still had no idea how to get the wooden planks off, so after about 30 minutes I decided to climb a nearby building because I was bored and found a rope at the very top for whatever reason. I eventually had to YouTube what to do because I was straight up lost and couldn't get the wooden planks off the door. Turns out there's a generator way off in the distance that you need to pick up and place below the door and get on top of that, so I did just that to finally get the door free at last. I then placed the generator at the top of the roof and repelled in with the rope attached to me and I was able to finally open the door at long last. 
I just ran through real quick and found some outfit, picked it up, then ran out the door and Mr. Peterson at the front door to be met with the screen saying, you win? With the question mark to make it all spooky sounding, finishing the alpha. I won't lie, I wasn't having the best time playing this because of the fact the neighbor kept glitching out of me along with other bugs. Almost everything that could have gone wrong went wrong because the neighbor got stuck, I got stuck, or just had 100% aggro on me and had to restart the level. I glitched out so many times whenever the neighbor would grab me and try to drag me outside the house as well, and it got to the point where the game wasn't even enjoyable anymore, but mainly just a slog hoping I don't get stuck or something weird happens again. I had to restart the game about 5 times because of this, and it really tested my patience as time went on. However, I do like how the game doesn't outright give you an idea on how to approach an objective, making you pay attention to how the neighbor works and what he's doing in order to achieve your goal. Figuring out to place the camera on the wall and use it to find the password to the door and not letting him burn the trash so the furnace runs out to get the key is a rewarding experience, but after those two things that's where the game got annoying to me. The animation of the crowbar doing something while it's not actually doing anything in the game is extremely annoying to deal with, and the open world surrounding the house isn't actually important to the overall game. Judging by the fact there's a generator that you can use that's way out there, it feels like there was more that was supposed to be done with the open world but the developers ran out of time to flesh things out for the player and only kept in the absolute necessities before launching the alpha. In hindsight, I figured out that I didn't even need to use the generator and only needed to use the rope, so that just makes me wonder why I was even in the level to begin with. To add to that, there's no indication to jump to the top of the burnt down building for the rope whatsoever. I literally just did it because I was bored. Why is it even up there to begin with? Like it's clearly a useful item to help get inside the door, but it's in a spot that makes no sense to go to as people are focused on the neighbor's house itself and not the top of some random house nearby. I can understand if the rope was in a place that makes sense, but when an integral piece to the puzzle is not even in the location you're at, it just feels cheap and annoying that the game is artificially forcing you to explore some place you shouldn't have to. Also the game itself just feels janky to play, like every time you fall from a medium height Quentin does this stumble animation that makes you lose all your items. And when Whenever the neighbor captures you and starts to drag you out the house, you have a chance of being sent to what can only be described as hell for a couple seconds before being flung straight into the air like an empty soda can. I get that's part of this game's overall feel and what they're trying to do here, but it's still so buggy and annoying so I ain't not gonna mention it. It takes me out of the experience and gets on my nerves dealing with stuff that should have been at least a bit more polished if you're showing it off to the public, but I digress. Hello Neighbor 2's alpha was clearly that, a very early look at the game and what the developers have built up thus far. While glitchy and janky, the core loop of figuring out how to thwart the neighbor and complete your task was in place and played decently, but things like being able to lead the player in the right direction better and an actual reason to explore the world surrounding you was needed. Nothing is more annoying than not having direction in a video game, because it's not very fun to have to jump on random roofs and run around an empty world for the chance something useful might come your way. Tiny Build and Eerie Guest Studios will listen to the feedback of this alpha, and so on October 26, 2020, they would release Alpha 1.5 to show off what they've got so far. This one has a similar goal, with the opening cutscene this time showing the neighbor kidnapping three trick-or-treating children and locking them up in the attic, so it's up to us to save them. The open world is a lot more detailed this time, and looks just a tad bit better now that more time was put into the surrounding structures. Given that I now know the flow of this alpha, I was able to start things off pretty alright. The rope is still at the top of the burnt down building, same for the generator at the gas station. The neighbor also seems to follow you around the map too which was different, though I couldn't tell if this was intentional or a bit broken given it's still an alpha state. I also found a crane that could be activated with the generator, but no matter what I did it didn't seem to do anything except move in a big circle, so I think this was something forgotten about during development and thrown into the game to fill in some empty space. The puzzle was also changed up a bit so that it wasn't just an easy run for people too, which I appreciated. I somehow managed to get my way through the game, first by grabbing a hold of the generator and setting up another conveyor belt that wasn't on in the house. I then reversed the direction of the working one that was burning all the trash by throwing an item at the switch, and then rushed into the room to grab a fire extinguisher and get out. I then turned on the other conveyor belt and used a fire extinguisher to move the crowbar and get it out of the spot it was stuck in. As I was planning my next move, the neighbor just ran off into the rest of the map for some reason, so I went into the main room and used a fire extinguisher on a trash fire until I could grab the key. I then used the rope to repel myself off the roof and take off the wooden boards and unlock the door, entering the attic. Instead of finding three kids, I found two strawmen dressed in their clothing with the crow costume completely gone. This is the part where I had no clue what to do, because no cutscene or anything was playing at all. And it turns out you're supposed to collect candy around the map to put in the children's basket. I did exactly that and grabbed all the candy there was, except my crowbar completely just disappeared on me while doing this, so I downloaded the cutscene that plays once you give the kids their candy.
As you can tell, I was having a good time all the way until I had to do the candy part of the game. There was no indication I had to search for candy in the first place, and frankly I don't have the patience to look through each and every house in the giant world on my own just to get the ending to the game. I understand if this was a secret ending, but no, it's literally THE ending, and I'm again left feeling like the game is trying to waste my time on purpose. Also, my crowbar just straight up disappearing on me wasn't very fun either. It ruined the run I had and frankly, I had no idea why such a game breaking bug is even in the game still. The overall house and level itself up to that point was actually really fun and way better than the last. The puzzles led into each other better and the goal is set even more in stone with some urgency as well, but the last part with the candy just left a sour taste in my mouth. With that being said, I did like Alpha 1.5 a lot more, as things were more fleshed out for the player in the world surrounding them, like how the neighbor now makes new audible clicking noises to tell the player their current emotion and what they're doing. The puzzles were more straightforward and less confusing, and the ending showing Mr. Peterson himself trapped in some weird room of sorts poses a lot of interesting questions. Like who exactly is the person in the crow costume now? Is it perhaps the guest like back in the Hello Guest games? Or is it someone else entirely? I like how it ties into the characters and story itself too rather than introducing a whole new plot point like with the end of the Hello Guest Alpha with that mysterious hat man. It adds more layers of what exists already rather than add a completely new thing in and convolute the story in an unnecessary way. Plus, I've always liked cliffhangers and stuff, so I can't fault the game for doing that. It always makes for a good teaser for what the future holds. Hello Neighbor 2's alphas were an okay look at what to expect in the sequel title. The first alpha was rough and not that enjoyable due to bugs and being given only a small amount of direction, but Alpha 1.5 fixed things up a bit and made the puzzles more enjoyable in the process. The open world itself is very barren though, and not being given a reason to explore and only doing so because it has an item you need makes it feel like a chore rather than an enjoyable experience. At this point in the game's development, it's clear they don't exactly know what to do with the open world just yet, only that they want it and will hopefully do something with it down the line. Whether they're able to implement an engaging open world or not is something we'll learn about soon, as on April 7, 2022, the Hello Neighbor 2 beta will be released for players to enjoy. What's up guys, my name's Sheep Rampage, and I'm gonna be discussing probably the most infamous build of Hello Neighbor 2 outside of the final version, the beta release. The Hello Neighbor 2 beta is the first real look into what Hello Neighbor 2 in its final version will look like bringing the open world elements to a whole new level, going from one original house in the alpha to multiple different homes with multiple new characters. The game starts with the now reappearing character Quentin acquiring his detective camera through a relatively engaging tutorial, before the guest himself swoops in attacking Quentin, until he snaps back into reality driving into the real location in the game to investigate a crime scene at the original house from the alphas. Upon investigating the basement in the home while avoiding the cops surveilling the place, we acquire a crowbar allowing us to open a barricaded door in our own home where we get our own bed and some other resources and stuff to help us out throughout the game. And this then brings us to the main portion of the game where the guest is now replaced by the classic Mr. Peterson from the other games. And in this iteration, he lives in an eerie massive museum home while we try to infiltrate his attic that appears to have some hidden secrets. Upon exploring the home a bit, we reach a trophy room puzzle of some sorts that requires collecting three animal heads for the statues inside of the room, which then unlocks this encased attic hook which is our game's main goal. And now this is where the open world elements start off because in any order of your choice you need to visit firstly the bakery, a location containing a baker of course where we must collect a lockpick hidden in her kitchen before then using it to open a case that includes another key which can be brought to the hub neighbor's home to unlock one of his doors containing the boar head. Next you can visit the mayor's luxurious home where using his vinyl record collection we can play a song to make him tired which will force him to go to sleep in his locked bedroom, that of which containing the second head above his bed frame being the bear head. Finally, we can then visit this stereotypical redneck home of the taxidermist, where after taking some conveniently placed instructions off his home on how to craft a fish head and then put him by his workbench, after waiting some time he will eventually build us the fish head that he then puts outside of his yard where he just starts shooting it. But if we grab it fast enough, we then have the third and final head for the neighbor which gives us the attic hook where we can can unlock his attic, and the game basically ends there without revealing too much, obviously. Now, as you could tell, this was a massive leap in ambition for the developers, and it would mold every other later edition of the game. However, this was definitely not the greatest attempt at a beta. For starters, while patched over time,
time, this game had a lot of just silly bugs. For example, you used to be able to beat the game just by breaking the neighbor's window and walking into the attic, which they've since boarded up. But there's also a ton of unfixable fundamental issues with the game as well, with the most prominent one being the AI. See, AI in Hello Neighbor has always been a pretty disappointing part of the game, despite how important it is to the franchise. However, with this one, they decided to redevelop the AI from before and decided to give it tons of new features like the ability to cut the player off and learn over time, which while on paper is a good idea, they just didn't implicate most of this stuff well. Whether there be issues like the enemies getting stuck, having a really low IQ, or just simply aren't very threatening, there isn't anything impressive about the AI here. Which really sucks here specifically because for one reason or another, most of the entire game is revolved around the AI. For example, the beggar with the lockpick is supposed to involve a puzzle that involves the player messing with their alarm clock, starting an accidental fire in the place, which we can then use as cover to sneak up and grab the pick from her desk. Only issue is, is that the AI is so dumb that you can really just go up and grab it whenever you want, no problem. Or an even worse example, when in the taxidermist home, like we said, you have to trick him into building a fish head by putting blueprints up on his workbench but the problem is actually getting him to go to the workbench and build it is literally impossible at times he will sit there completely frozen, leave the room without ever looking at the blueprint, or simply just ignore it when it's right in front of him. This step in the game, if you're lucky, can take 20 seconds, but if you're unlucky, can take longer than the rest of the entire game. It's a really cheap way to add time onto the game, and it's just simply frustrating. I had to restart the entire game multiple times because I thought it was just glitched. Now, that's not to say that there's only flaws with this new version. In fact, there's quite a lot to love here. The music is amazing, the open world elements elements work really well in this environment, and the mystery of the guest, while not explored upon in the beta for obvious reasons, is a relatively intriguing story and really leaves you wanting more. It definitely represented a lot of potential, at least for a beta. However, as a standalone game, it's impossible to play in this state, because all the flagship features like the other characters and the AI were clearly not designed well enough in this beta state, and it really just had me leaving the game frustrated when all was said and done. There is undeniable potential here, and the game is a lot less suffering than something like the original game. Plus, there's a ton more substance here than in the original alphas, despite the quality being somewhat questionable. But potential aside, on its own, it's relatively underwhelming. That's all for the beta. Thanks for having me, but back to Lanza for the next build of Hello Neighbor 2, the Hello Neighbor 2 demo. Now, before the release of the main game, a demo will come out showing people what to expect from the final release. The game's graphics at this point are actually very good, as the art style has been approved upon and tweaked in slight ways, and the frame rate being extremely high makes for a smooth experience through and through. The demo begins with you in a barn, and already the game is doing a much better job here as it gives you a small tutorial on the type of gameplay you'll experience. For example, when you get the rock and break a piece of glass for that part you need, that tells the player this game involves environmental puzzles and to look closely and think about your surroundings without outright telling them with text on screen. That's a great way for brand new players to figure out what to expect when playing the game, so going into this I was expecting things to be a lot more polished and focused overall. I was right, because the objective of the game is made pretty clear as soon as you enter Mr. Peterson's house. Find the four keys to unlock the door to the basement. Since I'm given the indication to look closely at my surroundings, I'm already aware of how the game works and what to do. For example, while walking through the house, I noticed the picture frame was out of place, and going up to it has you fix it, which implies that this is a puzzle of sorts and that I need to look carefully around the house. I ended up going room to room fixing all the picture frames I could find, and by doing so I'm led to a secret room with a key in it, unlocking part of the basement door with only three puzzles left. Exploring the house leads to more interesting puzzles too, like how in the ceiling in one room is the code to the nearby safe, yet you don't know what order it's in. That is, unless you look closely at the background, as the flags are in a certain color order and the numbers have the same colors going on. That's a good puzzle right there as it pays off to people that pay very close attention to their surroundings and makes them get even more invested in the game in the process. You eventually find another key by cutting open pillowcases with the scissors in the safe. Now only two more to go. There's a key in the bear's mouth but you can't grab it, but on the chest it's obvious that you need a switch in order to do so. After finding a cardboard box arm with the sword, you place it on a nearby cardboard box robot and rotate the arms around until the center of it pops open, giving you the switch. You place it in the bear and get the key, finishing that task up. 
The last one involves three dolls of Mr. Peterson and his family, and at first you're given no indication for what order to put them in, that is until you look at the drawing on the fridge and soon quickly put the pieces together. While exploring the map, I ended up finding a dirt pile with the shovel symbol telling me I needed to find one, and I did find one behind the house to the basement entrance, and when going back I was able to dig up a doll. I then remembered to notice a doll in an air duct but couldn't get in as I needed a wrench, but then I remembered seeing one on Mr. Peterson himself, so I snuck up behind him and grabbed it while he didn't notice, opened up the air duct and grabbed the doll putting them all into place as I got the final key for the door. Once you open the door and go into the basement, the demo ends telling you to buy the full game. This demo was a good slide showing people what to expect from the full game. The intro in the barn giving people an idea on what to expect was very smart and useful to add. The puzzles were simply designed yet intricate enough where they were interesting to figure out, and the environmental storytelling for how each puzzle is to be solved and how they led into each other is much better than the alphas. It's very easy to tell the game excels in smaller areas rather than a giant open world like they planned on in the alphas, because people will end up feeling like they're wasting their time exploring a massive area with very little that actually helps achieve the main goal in mind. The only puzzle I found a bit annoying was the one with the robot arms because you could rotate them all the way around and not having the arms stay in place when it was in the right spot made it feel a bit cheap, but I know it's such a small nitpick on my part so I know it's nothing important to the entire puzzle itself. One thing I didn't like though was that there really isn't any penalty for getting caught, Mr. Peterson just takes whatever items you have and you need to get them back again. That's not even a massive penalty, as you just need to go back to whatever spot the items were in and grab them again, like how I did with the wrench in one playthrough. Honestly, now that I think about it, you can't really penalize a player in any way at all in this game, because what else do you do in a puzzle game when someone gets caught? You can't just change up the puzzle on them because that would be extremely annoying and frustrating and discourage the player from playing any longer. And when you think about it, you can't really do anything at all other than just have them start from where they last were. It does get annoying though having to go back to each and every spot to pick up your items again before getting back to whatever you were doing, and it felt like the game came to a screeching halt whenever this would happen. This is part of the core gameplay loop though, so I understand this is something that can't be easily fixed unless you change a lot of things up, but it was still something that got on my nerves as I kept playing. As I thought about the demo more and more, it became clear to me that this game seems to be turning mainly into a puzzle game rather than a horror inspired one. This series already had a focus on puzzle elements throughout the years, but this one distinctly had no scares or eerie imagery at all, whereas the past titles at least had this otherworldly vibe going on like with the giant abnormal house to explore and the giant Mr. Peterson in the first game for example. This demo felt a lot more grounded in reality, and while I personally enjoyed it more because of that, I couldn't help but shake this feeling like they might be taking a slight misstep. I didn't worry too much though, as it was just a demo and the full product would be able to answer that for me, so I moved right along from that. Watching the beta and playing the demo gave me indications that yes, the developers at Eerie Guest Studios improved upon the alphas immensely, the only issue at this point was the game isn't really scary or tense anymore, which was something I pondered about as I was downloading the full game itself. I can understand making some sacrifices for a better video game overall, but changing a big part of the franchise's identity was a big risk that was in the back of my head when writing up this script, but now it's time to get into the actual full game itself and finally see what's in store. Hello Neighbor 2 would release on December 6, 2022, at 40 bucks for the base game and 60 for the deluxe edition with the DLCs. Given the nature of this video, I dropped 60 to get the full Hello Neighbor 2 experience and launch the game to see what's up. The game opens up with the cutscene introducing players to Quentin as he watches Mr. Peterson kidnap a child in front of him, and as he tries to escape, the guest scares him and makes him crash his van into a barn. You then do the barn intro similar to how the demo was, but as you leave you get knocked out by Mr. Peterson as he watches over your body for a moment before stealing your camera. You then suddenly wake up in the morning in a bed, and soon leave the building as you're introduced to the town of Ravenbrooks. The graphics in this game are actually pretty good if you ask me, and the art style helps with that too, as the cartoon aesthetic of the first game has been improved and tweaked upon in places that matters. What I like the most though is the music, the soundtrack is actually really enjoyable and is subtle whenever it needs to change to set the mood, and I appreciate that kind of work when it's done right. The game leads you to the first location through the crows in the sky, that being Mr. Peterson's house, now being guarded by the police. The puzzles have all been changed up from the beta and demo obviously, so things are still fresh for the player even when going through familiar territory. As to not spoil too much of the puzzles, I like how the code to the secret door is solved by looking at the first letters in the title of the show on TV, and the safe puzzle while being mostly the same, has a small little twist that took me a rather concerning amount of time to figure out. 
You can even go upstairs in this game now, adding even more for you to explore than just the bottom floor like in the demo. Once you get down to the basement, you then leave the house, now in the middle of the night, and make your way towards the museum where Mr. Peterson is hiding. After picking up a shovel, Quentin passes out in a nightmare dream sequence plays before waking up the next morning, ready to go on to your next puzzle. You head to a nearby bakery and scour the place, doing puzzles such as feeding the cat to get the number key for the cash register, all while this banger soundtrack plays throughout your entire run. <laughs> Once you put in the code, you get a fancy looking key, and you use it to unlock the main door to the museum. As you go about the place, you can faintly hear the child crying, and after going through some more miscellaneous puzzles, you eventually find a picture frame that plays another cutscene of Mr. Peterson and the child together, again ending with Quentin waking up in a bed for the next day. Up to this point in my playthrough, I hadn't had a single issue with the game yet, but things changed for me during this next section. The main puzzle you're supposed to do here at the hunter's house is to collect pages with numbers and put them on a board, and the corresponding color of each pin is used to indicate what number to put in the nearby safe for the key. The issue for me is that an item disappeared on me when I was doing my run, the letter C used to put on the refrigerator. I knew the game broke on me too because it took me a good hour of running around over and over until I finally realized what had happened and just googled the combination. It's a shame this happened to me because I was having a good time with the game up to this point, and to see a game breaking bug like this months after release is really annoying. Part of me hopes the items were somehow misplaced and spawned in a whole different area of the entire zone, but from my experience the game just bugged out on me. With your new key in hand, you head back to the museum and complete another set of puzzles, and head into yet another dream sequence with the metal bird creature of sorts raining gold coins down upon you before attacking you. Waking up once more, you head into the mayor's house and scour that place up as well. Completing puzzles like distracting a dog with food so you can get your hands on a scepter and place it on a statue, revealing one of five trophies you need in order to finish the main puzzle. After placing each and every trophy, you get a hidden key in a secret room, and then make your way to the museum once more to unlock the final door. After going through a puzzle that was way more annoying than I expected, you eventually find a missing book and place it in a bookcase, when completing that puzzle you are then able to open the attic door, revealing the child to be Aaron, Mr. Peterson's son, as a cutscene plays of him locking you in the room itself as he tries to get away. You look around the room for the numbers for the lock and manage to open it up in time, before making your way out of the attic and back into the museum. You then have to carefully avoid a Mr. Peterson now on crack as he speeds around the museum trying to catch you, and after completing the last few puzzles the game gives you its final cutscene as the story ends. <laughs> After completing the game and letting it simmer for a bit, it became pretty clear to me that this is better than the last title. As you play you can tell it's just more focused overall, and while the puzzles weren't the hardest thing in the world after getting into the flow of things, they were still satisfying to figure out as you went through each and every location. I like how the game never outright tells you how to figure out a puzzle, you always have to pay very close attention to your surroundings and put two and two together, and that makes for a satisfying loop that keeps people wanting to stick around further down the line. You get this feeling of accomplishment if you figure it out on your own, and it's such a simple design philosophy yet when put into practice it can make a simple puzzle game just that much more fun to figure out. I know I've said and shown it a few times already, but the soundtrack is extremely well made and really helps this game out in terms of atmosphere and tone, and in my opinion was the highlight of my experience, because if it wasn't for that soundtrack, it would have been much more of a pain to play through. I already shown y'all before, but the soundtrack in the bakery level was my favorite, but even outside of levels when you're just walking around the town the soundtrack really sets the mood and is enjoyable to listen to no matter where you are, which is something I very much appreciate and something often overlooked in video game development. I 
I'd argue that the soundtrack is the sole part of this game that is indisputably good no matter who you talk to, so good stuff on Eerie Guest Studios for producing it. Now the levels themselves, they were all pretty well made if you ask me. Mr. Peterson's house was great to go through, it wasn't some giant mess like in the original, and the level was different enough from the demo where it wasn't just a quick run in the park for players to figure out. As I said before, the bakery level was my favorite of the bunch, the music was just so good throughout my entire run going through the place, the only issue I had is that you could barely see the key on the baker's hip, if it was a little darker it would have saved me some more time, but it's such a small little detail that I didn't really care that much. The hunter's house unfortunately bugged out of me like I said earlier, and I do mean this without sounding biased because of that, but it was the weakest location in my opinion. I didn't really like the aesthetic that much of a big tall house as it was mostly just browns and greens, but I did like how vertical and cramped it felt as it gave the level a bit more of a rushed vibe as you went through exploring and trying not to get caught. The mayor's house was great, I love the colors going on with the blues and whites, that kind of color scheme gives off a sort of vacation-y vibe to it, and I was all for that. The greenhouse room, the hallways you walk through, the entire foyer, it just looked so well made color wise to me and really helped fix my mood after the sour experience from the hunter level. Also, the jazzy music that plays as you explore it is a massive plus, it fits the entire theme of the level perfectly. <sighs> The museum level was expansive too, and every single room felt like it had a purpose here even considering its massive size. You can tell they planned out the museum pretty early on in development, because as you play you get those keys from each level, and you always head to the museum to explore it some more. While having to go straight to the museum each time instead of collecting all the keys together and going in at once was strange, the museum itself wasn't very strange, and in fact made for a pretty good level overall. I like how it looks a bit old and faded, and the creepy rooms with the statue or the stuff on the ceiling was really cool to see. I also like how it's called a museum yet is built more like a house, meaning there's a story of why the house became a museum or vice versa, and I love those kinds of questions that come along with it. The only thing I didn't understand from this level was the camera. There really isn't sort of instance or meaning as to why the camera was in the safe other than Mr. Peterson just putting it there for some reason. And you don't do anything with the camera once you get it back either. It just felt like the developers needed to put something in there and that was the best thing they could think of, but other than that instance, the whole level was fleshed out very well. I like the foreshadowing with the dreams Quentin had too, as when you think about it, the dream with Aaron being dragged into his house mimicked what he saw in real life, so when you think back on the dream with the crow figure attacking Quentin, it mimics how it instead fell on Mr. Peterson in real life. I think foreshadowing is cool, as it gets people thinking about other things that might not have made sense at the time, and in turn gets you more invested in the lore surrounding the title and the franchise itself. Now a friend did mention to me that's not what they got from this and that it was just supposed to be creepy cutscenes for the sake of it, and maybe I am thinking of it in a different light, but either way, to me it was foreshadowing in my opinion, so of course I'm gonna say I liked it. Now with that being said, there were of course a couple things that were wrong with this game. The issue with my item disappearing on me during the puzzle at the hunter's house was very disappointing, as I had figured by now this game would have had that kind of stuff fixed already, especially after the extremely buggy launch this game had. The story isn't even practically non-existent, it is non-existent, as it's basically just to find Aaron and get him away from Mr. Peterson and that's it, with the only reasons to even go to the other locations being to get the keys for the museum. It's such a forced way to get people to explore the world, as it doesn't promote any player individuality in the way they go about things, and given this is supposed to be an open world game, that kind of freedom is integral to the experience in my opinion. It does beg the question however, why do these random citizens of the town each have a key to the museum in the first place? Perhaps I'm thinking way too deep into it, but it made no sense to go to these places story wise, only gameplay and environment wise. I wish there was a given reason that they had all the keys to begin with, like maybe the whole town is in on Mr. Peterson's antics, but that'll be something to think about for the future. I can definitely see Tiny Build and Eerie Guest Studios going down this route though, just cause the storytelling setup is absolutely perfect, so if stuff comes out down the line involving other NPCs and townsfolk, you heard it here first. The whole teaser with the guest seems to be just that, a teaser for what's to come in the future, and to see no payoff with the character was really disappointing. I understand that the guest's entire existence at this point has been constantly changing throughout development, but when they cause the car crash at the beginning of the game you expect them to have a bigger stake in the gamer's story, but that never happens, they literally only show up in a cutscene the entire time in the game. The game doesn't even imply the guest is the one who knocked out Quentin at the end either, so as far as that lead goes it's just a random character they haven't figured out yet which is why it's so vague during the cutscene. It seems that instead of being super weird like the first game, Eerie Guest Studios kept it more grounded in reality and played it safe with what little you can call a story, which in this case did make for better gameplay, I just think they played it way too safe. 
It's a shame too, because the possibilities to make the guest an actual force to be reckoned with is there, they just don't seem to want to take that step forward. They had an opportunity to use the guest as a sort of subplot for the town of Ravenbrooks to perhaps flesh things out with them more, and maybe even the town and its inhabitants, but instead they just cause you to crash your car to introduce players to the tutorial level and that was it. Like sure, there are cassette tapes scattered about the town to give hints of that, but they're so bare bones and boring that it doesn't add anything to the lore behind the guest or the town other than the guest has been around for a while. It was a massive missed opportunity, and I hope they do something with the guests soon before they become an afterthought. Something that I can't seem to get around is the art style of the game. On one hand, I really like the art style. It's cartoony and the characters in town itself are very well made and pleasing to look at, but on the other hand, said art style holds the game back in certain aspects, in this case losing any semblance of horror. I know I've said this before, but this game has nothing resembling a scary atmosphere at all, and the weirdest imagery I can think of would be the upside down room in the museum, but that's nothing compared to the first game. It's funny because I'd argue the art style clashes more in the first game in the direction that goes in, whereas in this sequel it fits more but only because of the sacrifices made to make this game more grounded in reality overall. I realize it's a bit strange to talk about because there's no winning in this spot, as the art style is a very subjective thing to talk about and comes down to personal taste. So while I believe they made the right choice in keeping it the way it is, some part of me feels the art style is holding the game back in certain aspects. I do believe they can make it work however, they just need to think of more creative ways to implement weird and scary imagery in future content. Speaking of content, the game itself is also just very barren when it comes down to it. There's literally nothing else going on in the world other than just the initial puzzle you're solving. You don't see any NPCs walking around, it's just the people showing up whenever the game says they need to show up. At the very least, they could have given the town some sort of life in one way or another. Even a small handful of people doing something simple like sitting at the park or sitting on the tables at the bakery could have brought a lot of life into this game, but instead, the town of Ravenbrooks feels like a bunch of very pretty town assets with a lack of actual and literal character going about. The only reason to explore the town would be to collect those cassette tapes I mentioned earlier, but that's literally the only sort of life this town has to offer outside the NPCs you come across in the puzzles. It doesn't make any sense why little if no effort at all was put into giving the place some sort of life, and given this game took 5 years to make, the excuse of running out of time won't work here. This game needed more content and is sorely lacking it, and there aren't any excuses that can be made to justify why all this is missing. As far as the open world goes, the game really isn't even open world in a normal sense, more like a bunch of puzzle locations packed together in a small little area. Sure, the town is small already, but it literally has nothing to do with the game other than the setting and that's it. There could have been so much done with the town, like a secret side mission puzzle to get into a house and find some cool easter eggs, but unless the house is integral to the story, it's just a 3D model looking pretty and taking up space. If this was a $20 game I'd understand, but this is 40 bucks and I don't want a quick 4 hour game and nothing else to do for 40 bucks. That's insanely overpriced if you ask me. Yeah, I almost forgot to say, I beat the game in around 4 hours, and if you ask me, that's extremely short for any kind of video game asking me to fork over $40 to play. I've played much better video games that last twice as long for half the price, so to ask for $40 almost feels downright insulting. Hello Neighbor 2 is a game that while improves upon its predecessor, only makes tiny steps forward in a franchise that needed a big jump instead. It corrects a lot of what made the first game unenjoyable, but in doing so the game plays extremely safe and loses a bit of its horror identity in the process. While there are some positives such as the puzzles and music, the negatives far outweigh them, as the open world is non-existent, the story itself is non-existent, and the game is extremely short for its asking price. Combine that with a bug that should have been fixed by now, and you find yourself playing a game that doesn't even get over the hump of mediocrity, despite the help of its enjoyable puzzles and soundtrack. It's a shame it ended up like this, but the deluxe edition of the game did include more DLCs to play, so let's see how that fares out for us. There are two DLCs for this game, the first being Back to School, which has Quentin investigating a nearby middle school in the middle of the night. I'm gonna keep it real with y'all, this DLC isn't worth it. The level itself isn't very interesting, and its massive size ends up making the game feel like a drag at points. The school isn't even made badly, but going past the same orange lockers makes it feel uninteresting and boring, even if it does make sense design-wise to be that way. I don't know why they decided to make this level so big, the game excels in smaller complex puzzle locations, yet they decide to make this one massive, most likely to justify its $15 asking price online. Now I will say that once you get to a certain point with the clock level stuff that the game does get a bit better, but it's short lived compared to the rest of the time playing, so it feels disappointing once everything is done and over with. On top of this, I had so many issues in playing. It crashed on me 3 times whereas the base game never crashed once, items got stuck behind walls and in other objects, and there's this mechanic where if the black dog gets you, you lose your items, yet the game doesn't send you back to the beginning of the level or nothing like with normal puzzles, you just keep moving forward until you realize all your stuff is gone. 
It doesn't make sense as throughout the whole base game, anytime you're caught, you get sent back to the beginning, yet only when the black dog gets you, the game lets you run off and you still lose your items. It's so stupid and backwards, like why not just make the black dog send you back to the start as well as taking your items instead of wasting my time with such a mechanic. Hell, I don't even know if this is an oversight or an actual mechanic, because if it is a mechanic, they need to get rid of it or make it work like how it's been working throughout the entire time I played the base game, because that's just a straight up dumb thing to even deal with, period. Some of the puzzles also don't have a flow to them, like at one point I got softlocked because there's this light that's already installed for you to use on the Venus flytrap, yet when I came back with the stuff I needed the light just straight up disappeared on me. I couldn't progress without it, so I had to restart the whole level which was extremely frustrating. Even after completing a whole playthrough I saw the light was gone again, so either I did an event that caused the light to disappear too early, or it bugged out again but thankfully after I beat the game. My theory is the janitor takes off the light and hides it from you, but there's no way for me to know this is a thing as the light comes installed already, and I'm not given any sort of icon that tells me I can pick it up either when I go up to it. Someone tell me I'm wrong here and maybe I'm just dumb, because I'm pretty sure the game bugged out on me, but I can't say for certain because part of me refuses to believe such a game breaking bug is still in the game months after release. Either way, that's a pretty big issue to have in this game, and if I'm paying 60 bucks for the base game plus DLC, I don't expect something this unexplained and annoying to get in my way. Now I haven't talked about the AI in this game because to be frank, it's just basic stealth AI and nothing you haven't seen before. I know one of the big selling points of this game is super smart AI, but it really isn't, it's just above average at best. Now I didn't run into any issues during the main game, but there were so many points throughout this DLC that the janitor got stuck doing the same task over and over again, like opening and closing a door. AI is also predictable, as whenever you do a task and this icon appears, it means the game is saving, which tells both you and the AI that whatever you just did caused a new thing to start happening. It wasn't as notable in the main game due to the locations being small so it felt like they were everywhere at all times, but in this level I actively started to use the location of the janitor and the dogs to figure out where to go next, because they always revolved around whatever area I needed to go to in order to progress the puzzle I was currently doing. This is more the level design not mixing well with an AI made to function in smaller sized environments, but when you combine the two in the worst possible settings they can be in together, you get this school level. Back to School is a DLC that takes a couple steps backwards for the game. While the base game focused on smaller areas to explore and in turn had a more in tune puzzle solving experience, Back to School had me going through a giant level and running back and forth along with multiple crashes to boot. Add the soft locking issue and game designs like the Black Dog, and you have yourself a very middling DLC at best. I don't understand why this level exists, because it's the exact thing the game should avoid having on its roster, yet it's the first big DLC that came out, and as such had me worried about how the next would go as I launched it up. Late Fees is a whole nother DLC in of itself. If you thought Back to School was a mess, just wait for this, cause it's certainly something. To get the positives out of the way, the aesthetic is pretty cool in my opinion, as having an over exaggerated messy library made for a good environment to explore. I like all the books and giant bookshelves around you, it makes you feel like you're in a strange fictional world of sorts. The main puzzle itself was also much simpler. Find all the books and place them in their correct bookcase, which works well given the massive size of the level as you're not doing anything complex. The music is also very good too, with the violin background setting the tone for the massive establishment, giving it a sense of wonder and awe as you explore around the building. Now those are the only good things from this DLC, because the rest of it was absolutely garbage. Items kept getting stuck in the ground or the wall, the chandelier you swing on is broken as hell trying to use it when jumping from location to location, and there was this one puzzle with a red valve that I never even used throughout the entire playthrough, so I have no idea why it was even a thing in the first place. There's also no proper story going on in this level at all, no overarching plot of a weird library to explore, you just dropped into the setting and expected to explore it. Back to school at least had its small little story going on, but this level completely lacks any of that. The parkour in this game was also put to awful use in this level, as there were so many times where I just couldn't grab things or the way the level was built made it so much harder than it should have been. Honestly, the parkour in this game isn't even the worst because it's not heavily relied upon, yet in this level it is and it makes me want to rip my hair out. It doesn't make any sense 
to me why they place so much emphasis on the parkour in this game for this level, because this game isn't a climbing simulator, it's a puzzle game. Once you get down into the basement of the library, that's where things take a turn for the absolute worst. You're supposed to shut off these valves to get rid of this mysterious oil substance as you progress deeper and deeper below. It looks cool and feels like you're finally starting to get somewhere and maybe find some sort of story to this level at first. Soon you find yourself at the very bottom next to this contraption, eventually opening a safe and taking a book. As you do so, the oil starts to flood the room, and so you have to hastily make your way back up to the surface before it's too late. It seems like a fun, intense little task to escape, except it's virtually impossible to keep up because of a multitude of reasons. First, the platforms you're supposed to jump onto don't even let you climb on them, so you have to do this awkward motion of getting on the pipe next to it before you jump on. Second, the parkour elements are put in full force in this part of the level, and given how janky it is, it makes for a very frustrating time full of moments where you should have grabbed this ledge or that ledge but didn't because the game said so. Now those two don't sound the worst at a first glance, but this ties it all together. The oil rises at an extremely fast rate. It is absolutely insane how fast it rises in this level. You have no breathing room at all, and there were countless moments where I was almost at the exit only to die because it was literally too fast to keep up with. I spent a good 40 minutes on this part of the level alone because I wasn't going to give up, but I was extremely frustrated playing it, and my experience was completely ruined because of this. After almost an hour of this insanity, I finally managed to find a very stupidly convoluted route to the exit after countless tries, and here's what happened to me. Yeah, the door that was supposed to have the open symbol on it glitched out on me, and that's when I gave up and exited the game, because that's when the level's supposed to end anyways with the cutscene of Quentin escaping from the library itself. I understand they want the level to be challenging, but this extremely frustrating type of gameplay is not fun to play whatsoever. Also, on launch, the DLC didn't even have an ending cutscene. You would literally just go up the stairs and stand in the library with no indication the level was over. It's actually insane that the level was literally unbeatable at one point in time. It's so obvious this was a rush job to make the release schedule. Like sure, the ending cutscene was added in a later update, but the fact that this was being sold for $15 when it wasn't even complete is actually pathetic. Both DLCs for Hello Neighbor 2 are not worth it whatsoever. Back to School is a slog to play through due to its massive size, and Late Fees just straight up sucks outside the setting and music. While Back to School at the very least had some semblance of a story going on, Late Fees did not, and instead decided to replace that with an insane difficulty spike simply to pad out the gameplay. One thing both these levels have in common is that the threats themselves aren't even hard to avoid at all. Both levels have long corridors you could just run through, and Late Fees itself is especially easy as you could just hop off a railing and get away. When the threat of being captured isn't even an issue, the game becomes boring to play and in turn makes the game a drag because they aren't near the quality the base game is. Honestly, it seems like the developers had no idea what to do with these levels other than just make them look good. Speaking of the developers, it wasn't even Eerie Guest Studios that made these levels, it was Steel Wool Studios instead, the people behind Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. Honestly, this makes a lot more sense, because the drastic change in quality is noticeable, and it definitely feels like a Steel Wool game as Security Breach had its issues with the world being way too open and it being easy to avoid all the animatronics. That's exactly how these DLCs feel to play, so to see the apple not fall far from the tree makes so much more sense now. It feels like Tiny Build had Steel Wool finish up some prototype or cut level ideas or whatever and sell them as day one DLC so they could make a little extra cash on launch and have a reason to sell a deluxe copy of the game. It's also worth pointing out that Steel Wool had their credit taken off the level soon after launch, so whatever went on there is surely an interesting story to be told once it comes to public light. Hello Neighbor 2 is a very strange game to talk about now that I've let it simmer a bit in my head. 
You can tell the developers decided to focus more on the puzzles and curb the horror elements that they originally went for in the first title. You can see that shift in focus when going from the Hello Guest prototype all the way to now. What started off as an open world with the guests stalking you and having you constantly look behind your back, to protecting a theme park while the guest still stalks you, to breaking into his house in both iterations of the alpha, to going through multiple locations of other NPCs in the beta, and to the main game fully committing to that idea, it became clear the focus was on the puzzles in a more grounded world overall. So many people have their differing opinions on the final game, and it makes for a lot of interesting conversations. For example, we've seen the focus was on the puzzles for the sequel, and in doing so the game lost some of that horror identity it had in the process. In my opinion, I think it was the overall smarter sacrifice to make, because gameplay wise the game was more enjoyable, even if I wished the horror elements they introduced in the Hello Guest prototype stayed around. That also begs the question, what exactly was the reason for Hello Guest's existence? It's clear the game was branded as a sort of fake out to hide the development of Hello Neighbor 2, but something tells me that Dynamic Pixels really wanted to make a horror follow up, but Tiny Bill didn't want that. The theory has some credence to it as Tiny Build would end up buying out Dynamic Pixels and forming eerie guest studios with old members, this time with full control of the studio as they now own them and have much more influence on how things are going to go down. There's no reason to buy something out unless you want more control, and given how the final product is drastically different from the initial idea, that added influence most certainly has something to do with it. It's just a theory, but if it was correct it would certainly answer why the early development of the game was far different from what the final product ended up being like. As we wrap things up here, I wanted to emphasize this part last. As of this video, it's $40 for the base game and $60 for the DLCs. The DLCs are not worth it at all whatsoever no matter how you put it, they are not good and I highly, highly recommend you skip out on them. Now the main game itself is not worth $40. It only took me around 4 hours to beat, and given I went in blind and don't play puzzle games that often, someone who does can easily beat this game in 2 hours. I recommend buying it at 20 bucks max, because despite its shortcomings, it's still a fun puzzle game, it's just that everything else outside the puzzles play extremely safe and fall completely flat. So much can be talked about the what ifs and what could have been seen throughout development, like what if they kept that mysterious hat man from the Hello Guest Alpha around, or what if they went along with that teaser at the end of the Hello Neighbor 2 1.5 Alpha with Mr. Peterson behind the door. To bring up these ideas only to never build upon them and just leave them in the dust is disappointing, because the potential to build an actual interesting storyline was right there, they just scrapped it all in order to play safe. It's almost frustrating to a certain degree to think about this in hindsight, but it's not worth my energy to think about stuff that's since long gone. Of course the franchise has other things going on outside of Hello Neighbor 2, like Tiny Bill going forward with that animated series pilot from years ago and producing a couple more episodes, and even tasked Steel Wool to create Hello Neighbor Search and Rescue, a VR title coming out sometime in 2023. I think that move could work, as while playing a game on a computer and TV screen isn't scary, being put into the game itself with VR could help bridge that gap a bit. So only time will tell to see if the game ends up being good or not. The potential is certainly there, and if Stubel can pull it off, I think the franchise could start heading in a positive direction while we're finding the horror along the way. It's easy to see that Tiny Build saw the shortcomings of Hello Neighbor and worked on improving what was good. Hello Neighbor 2 did improve upon the first game, yet despite there being a 5 year difference from each respective release, it doesn't even meet expectations. I try to tell myself, oh it's not so bad, but I always come back to the same conclusion that yes, it isn't bad, it's just not good either. It's below average at the very best, and that's one massive disappointment to me because the game had all the opportunity in the world to become a great title, but the developers completely blew it. One thing that I keep seeing people say is the game is unfinished even months after the patch has fixed up a lot of the initial bugs and stuff like that. I don't think unfinished is the right word to use here anymore, I think the best way to describe this game is all polish, no substance. The franchise could have taken one or two big steps forward, but instead it seemed to tidy things up a bit while barely moving a tiny bit towards actual progress. Perhaps more DLCs will drop and help flesh out the town of Ravenbrooks more, but until then, you can count me out on this one. With that being said, the franchise is technically in a better spot than it was a couple years ago, and only time will tell if Tiny Build is able to take things to the next level, or if the franchise will continue to toe the line of mediocrity at best.